Uh, hello, everybody. Um, my name's Sam. Thanks very much for coming along to our panel. Um, there's obviously been a bit of a major mistake um, in venues. Um, I looked at the, cat the uh, program, and um, unfortunately, uh, this isn't wine o'clock. Just making sure you all know that there is free booze, and it's not here. So in case you're in the wrong place, we're just going to ignore it. If you all want to leave, that's fine. We won't take it personally, because I... Yeah, we're all right up here. Look, we've got white pims. But, you know, for you lot, um, I don't know what to say, really. Uh, anyway, we're all a bit flattered that you've turned up versus some cheap wine. So thanks very much. And um, uh, I'm here with two um, really interesting people um, and a duck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wild screen, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so... Um, firstly, to my left is Charlotte Jones, um, and Charlotte is an exec producer at BBC Earth Productions, um, and she primarily oversees production across um, everything the world, really, so uh, long-form uh, production and development, and hold on a second, my, my scroll's gone mad, uh, digital, short-form, virtual reality, and live event content. And I'm sure, uh, in fact, having seen some of the content, other stuff too, um, to be fair. So welcome, Charlotte. And um, Graham Wallington, further to my left, is the CEO of uh, Wild Earth. And um, he's overseen more than 60 wildlife uh, TV shows, including the very successful Safari Live on National Geographic, Wild. Um, he's co-founder of Wild Earth and is developing several new w live wildlife projects around the world. He's a big believer in authenticity and interactivity. So if you want to boo, hiss, or throw stuff at him, that's absolutely fine, I think. <laughs> um, and um, he loves live programming, thinks it's the best way to provide um, electric content. And um, uh, that's Graham. So basically what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the fact that um, we can all watch lots of stuff all of a sudden. Uh, basically, on your phone, on your telly, um, on screens, um, all around the world, we suddenly have this kind of plethora of amazing content on demand, live, whenever we want. So what are people watching if they're watching less television? Um, and we all know they are watching last tele a, lot of, a lot less television than they were, say, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so where do people go um, to watch that content? And kind of what I decided to put a little spin on it was... Um, what are people doing that's just totally different? Because I think um, we're in a place here where uh, we're very lucky to be amongst some incredible broadcasters and producers and writers and talent. Um, and so what are the things that aren't necessarily six times 60 on linear t television? Um, so what I'm going to do is play you a little clip of something first, just because it's the first one on the list and it's all about me. Um, and basically, this is um, something that we did that was completely different. I run a TV production company. I'm getting the me bit out of the way first so I can talk with these two. But I run a production company that does fairly lots of different things because we find it quite difficult to get long form commissions away at the moment. So we've ended up creating a YouTube network and various other things in order to pay the bills, really, and because it's quite fun to be your own commissioner. So um, part of what we've done is uh, realize that we can't get paid by uh, linear TV to do quite all the projects that we come up with. So we've started talking to brands, um, consumer brands and other organizations. One, to collaborate, and more of that with Graham later, but also in order to find money to pay for filmmaking. So um, we've just done a project with PlayStation uh, where they launched a big game called Uncharted 4, um, wanted to do some content to go with it, and um, we made a series called Conquer the Uncharted, where we asked real-life people to go and conquer real-life stuff that they wanted to do. Um, and we got paid to do it by a brand who didn't give us notes and kind of just got really excited about it and were very pleasant all the way through, which was wonderful. Um, so uh, let's play a bit of uh, just a very short clip from there, please. When PlayStation offered me my uncharted adventure, oh, I'm thinking my goal here is to kayak you over in Juruena waterfall. The most powerful waterfall in my life. Uncharted 4, only on PlayStation. PS4, for the players. 
Oh, forgot to clip that bit. Anyway, basically, that's an eight-minute film about a guy doing something he'd always wanted to do, which is lob himself off a waterfall. Um, we couldn't get Donald Trump. <laughs> he did it himself. But anyway, um, we thought it'd be, um, it, was a, it was a fun thing to do, and um, we kind of got paid the same amount for that as we would do to make an hour for a BBC channel. So it's really interesting, um, not that... 30 second version of the eight minute version. And it's just interesting to know that those kind of opportunities are very much out there now because advertising is falling apart and um, people need content that actually is real stories and that's what quite a lot of you do incredibly well. <sighs> so I've got that out of the way. And now we can talk about everybody else. So um, I'm gonna start with you, Charlotte, because we've had a couple of chats and, and, we, and it's really interesting all the amazing things that you guys at BBC Earth are doing um, and kind of, Primarily, who'd have thought we'd all be spending so much time on stuff that wasn't necessarily primarily for domestic linear audiences? Um, I, I suppose I wanted to ask you, you've been at BBC Earth Productions for four years now. Um, do you think the trend is becoming uh, more, in, uh, do you think people are becoming more interested in things away from primarily kind of prime time TV um, as you go forward in your time there? <laughs> That's a very tricky question. Sorry about that. Um, well, no, I think people are watching as much television. I think we there was a piece of um, research which was bandying around BBC recently, which actually said that there isn't that big a shift in TV, reduction in TV viewing. But it's what people are doing alongside it, isn't it? So it's, um, you know, TV is still the main part of the business, which particularly the BBC is driving our business in the UK and globally. Um, what we're doing as our productions is creating content which um, extends and, and creates some sort of presence of the Earth brand for the consumers who are engaging with the TV so that there's more awareness of it and more desire to come back to the TV proposition so that you create this virtual circle. I think what's happening, and you know, I've been at, at productions for nearly four and a half, five years now is that in that time, the people's ease around digital media, ancillary content, has become much uh, more embracing. You know, they don't see it as an either or, and they're seeing it as a way to complement what they're doing. So I think, um, and it's also teaching people new ways of describing stories, events, experiences, which may have relevance in a long-form storytelling, as it does in a, in a short-form. So, you know, I think, People are feeling more um, uh, curious about investigating what is all these other formats and how it can help them tell their own story. So a lot of us are all kind of just about starting to think about short form and, um, and stuff that isn't necessarily linear, but you guys have been actually developing it, producing it and delivering it for some time, haven't you already? Um, yeah. I mean, we do... So the interesting thing is, I think for a lot of people, um, you know, additional content around TV production sometimes stretches to digital, so stuff on YouTube, Facebook content, uh, VR experiences on YouTube or whatever it is. I think the BBC, I hate to say, is quite different because we have many other opportunities to create uh, branded content which can get to a wide range of consumers. So, you know, quite a lot of uh, commissioned content can have a can connect with an audience on a digital platform. What we do on a, an international global level is connect with potentially new markets, people that we never reach with, you know, a Facebook piece of Spring Watch content. Um, Tim Screens is here, so I have to say that. Um, you know, so that that goes out. That's brilliant, <coughs> and that does the job to engage the community in that world. But what about the other the other? Uh, people that we know that we can engage internationally, well, you're never going to get them with that. But, for example, we have a, a relationship with Holland America Lines, which is a cruise ship company, which is extraordinary. So that is... is that like Noah's Ark? Like Noah's Ark, but less animals, oh, man. more free food. Oh, wicked. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, that's, that's a North American market of, you know, very family orientated people who, you know, God knows how we get to them. Um, and so this is a, a commercial opportunity which has been sought by worldwide and various people that we work with. 
we've, we create all sorts of content with them. We do films, we do uh, concerts, so classical concerts, and, and these are 800 seat theatres that are on the front in the front of a ship. I know it's called something else, other than the pointy bit at the front. Boat. Boat. Ship, actually. Sorry. You put a boat on a ship, but not a ship on a boat. And um, we've even done game shows with podiums and, you know, I know all about the psychological impact of negative scoring as a result of doing this. But so all of this is Earth-branded content. It has high production values. It sort of plays to the to the Earth brand. It's a massive brand play, isn't it? Yeah. And you, 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 you've done... Um, you've kind of slightly slid into gaming a little bit in VR as well, is yeah, that right? Yeah. Because VR is a challenge um, for all of us in lots of ways, um, especially if we're thinking of moving into it. We've looked at it a lot, and, and I suppose the, the jump that we've always wanted to make, well, I personally, is into VR gaming, because it looks just so much more fun. Mm. And um, do you want to talk a little bit about the clip that y you're going to play? Yeah. So, um, again, you know, the, uh, the way Earth production works, we work within uh, worldwide. We work with a range of commercial partners all around the world. So I work with Japan and Tokyo. And, you know, we're basically looking. We're like body snatchers, ambulance chasers. And we're, but we're looking at commercial opportunities for the appropriate commercial partner to create uh, consumer-facing content. So obviously, VR is a big play at the moment. And what we also need to assess with VR is whether or not it's, everybody's asking, is it a format which will ultimately be something which specialist factual entertainment, whatever you want to call what we do, is going to, to exist in? Well, you know, it's a hard fight. You have to have pointy, sharp elbows to get into the funded bit of VR, and we've just done that. We've got a three-film deal with Oculus, which is amazing, and it's a great opportunity for worldwide and the BBC to try and create pieces of content to assess how the market responds to it. Mm. So, um, and also, when you get into these markets, you're then watching you know, all the other players, because it might not be VR, but it might be AR, or something that we don't even know exists. So, what we did with Oculus, um, we had I'm enough. hoping it's the right clip, I'm just going to say that. Well, now. if it isn't, I'll quickly change. Yeah, yeah. So we, we've got three films, and we decided strategically, um, obviously it's an Oculus Rift, it's going to be on the store, so you can sort of slightly predict who's going to be coming to it. So we've created three, one which is purely gaming, which is totally uh, computer-generated gaming with all the language um, and sort of techniques. So for a gamer, it would be totally intuitive. One which is more of a sort of CG, 3D, using positional head tracking and controllable interactivity around a piece of live action which suddenly bursts into CG. And the other one which is live action, experiential, but you have multiple storylines that you can choose. So you have agency. So in all of them you have agency. We had enough money and the Rift gives you enough functionality to move from a 360 2D thing into an interactive thing so people can go in and do stuff. So, so anyway, Beetle, which is the one which we're just going to show a clip of, mm -hmm. uh, we're working with Play Nicely in Bristol who are the most incredible bunch of digital creatives. And it's a question of where working out how the mechanics of gaming fits with deliver <laughs> delivering fact and trying to sort of create something which feels comfortable for both tribes, you know, a sort of people who are coming to it who may not be gamers, and gaming, gamers who are not going to feel as if they're playing some sort of sad imitation of something. So it's, it's been a challenge, but I think we're nearly there. Great. Let's roll it. Let's hope it's the right one. And it isn't voice yet either. So it's a beetle. It's a beetle. This is a new piece of beetle, and his name's Ugi. And we're seeing that the canvas move around. Is it um, motion activated? So where you look on the screen, is it one of those? You can, well, it changes cameras as it goes around. You can then drive your beetle all around this environment. Right. So there are three levels. These are um, video clips that you collect. So if you go ping, and then the, the whole thing is you collect as many points as you can and you go through three levels. You're basically chasing that lovely lady there. So the, the mission is for our male Lucrista to find his female mate at the end of it. To get to the end, he also has to fight ants. So 
eat ants, you also kicks them, and you can control it with a PlayStation uh, right. controller. Um, and then we have big army ants that come out of nests and try to kill them. Um, I mean, and this was for Oculus? Yeah. Okay. So this, on this. So this is looking up at the mountains, coming back down. So obviously you fall off this. When you're in it, this doesn't really do it, you know. It's hard to imagine what it's like to be totally in that world, but you're falling off these rocks. There's a script on it which is telling you, uh, you know, about information about the beetle, what he's doing at that particular time, reminding you that you're looking for your female and where she's going to be. And, and the premise is you go, you collect all your big video tokens, and then at the end you meet up with your lovely lady and watch some BBC archive of your elite piss for Is that right? And, yeah. and get Netflix and chill? Yeah. Yeah, yeah wicked. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so... Um, this, you can see how this could extrapolate, couldn't you, into be once once the technology is kind of because this is early days on Oculus Rift. It's only really just being released as a hardware um, kind of solution, isn't yeah. it? Um, but other than the Samsung Mobile tie-up, so you can I can kind of see how in three or four years' time you are just that beetle living in its world as well. How something like this, you guys getting involved in this technology right at the beginning, yeah, gives exactly. you the ab ability to be involved in the in this world as it becomes much more immersive and much more kind of powerful. Um, yeah, which I is mean wonderful. all of this, it doesn't, because it's a 16.9 flat thing, it's hard to appreciate, you know, you've got a full PlayStation controllability on that, so, but, which obviously you just can't see on that. Yeah. But yes, I mean it's good to, so once these go into Oculus, into the store, we'll be able to, hopefully we'll have some sort of feedback in terms of who's, who's buying what and what that means in terms of, obviously, whether or not Oculus are going to commission more, but obviously, you know, where our most, the sweet spot for us is. Yeah, because the thing everybody will remember from 3D is if you get involved and you learn how to do it, it does um, empower you greatly for yeah. whatever the next version yeah. of that is that comes through and how that develops. So I'm going to segue nicely there to Graham. So Graham, um, thanks for uh, all your contributions so far. They've been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, in the meantime, <laughs> yeah, you're there, baby, just ride that wave. So, um, so Graham's come all the way from South Africa. I'm very pleased to be sat on a panel with him because we've been collaborating a lot recently. Is it South Africa you've come from? Yes, I was in South Africa yesterday. There you go. So thank you for that. Um, and um, Graham, you started off um, in digital didn't you, with uh, World Earth back in the day. Yeah. And you've always been a new things person. And I say that in the nicest possible way, because <laughs> I love innovators. And um, Graham's innovation really um, has been around uh, live transmission for, the, for quite some time now. Um, and um, Graham and I have just collaborated on something. Graham putting all the work in, me putting basically no work in, which is how well, I like it. Um, and um, we, we've just worked on a really exciting project in Africa together that made me look fantastically clever and accomplished with, and um, where Graham did all the hard work. So I'm feeling a little bit um, of a liberty taker at the moment. So um, Graham, why don't you tell us, give us your elevator pitch on um, Safari Live because uh, it won't be everyone here, some people won't know about it. So could you, would you mind giving us the elevator pitch? Sure, absolutely. So Safari Live is a twice daily live Safari uh, show. Um, it's, it's more of an experience. I mean, what, what, what we do is in, every morning at sunrise and every afternoon at sunset, we, um, we go out for three hours. Um, a team of about 20 people um, put out two safari vehicles in the northern Sabi Sands in South Africa next to Kruger National Park, as well as a bushwalk, sometimes a drone, and sometimes a tent set. Um, and um, and, and, and we, we make this three hour long interactive show, which the purpose of which is to, is to really as faithfully and as accurately recreate the experience of going on a game drive on a safari in Africa. Um, uh, with, with all the details, plus a whole lot more that you wouldn't be able to achieve so easily um, in, um, in, 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 in the real world. Um, and, and then what we do is, in addition to producing these two shows daily on the internet, um, we also license them, uh, quite a few of these shows, to National Geographic Wild in the United States, um, and then they put them out on their network as well. 
Um, and we've been doing that now for, um, with Nat Geo Wild for, um, I think, coming up on two and a half years now. So it's quite a, quite a while. Um, and, um, and I started doing this with Africa back in 1998 with live webcams, which was a JPEG that refreshed every 30 seconds with no audio. So it's <laughs> come quite a long way in that time. Amazing. And um, it's been a real learning curve for me. Um, and um, should we, should we um, talk about the clip that you're going to play? I haven't seen it, so I don't know whether... Um, or okay, should, cool. Yeah. Well, Is that okay? The, that's the collaboration that Sam yeah. and I did. Yeah, so, so why don't you tee it up, because so you're going to do a much better the, job than I am. So explain the, the, what it was and, and kind of... But first, what the problem was. So we, we've, got, we've, got, we've really done super well in the US with, with Safari Live, um, and we've got, a, we've got a really large digital audience. We've got a, a really great customer and audience with Nat Geo Wild, um, and, uh, and, and that's going really well. But the UK has been a very, very difficult market for us to get a lot of traction in. And, um, and, and there's, a, there's a bunch of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is, is that to put it on um, television, live, wildlife television in the UK is challenging because the time of day that our best safari is, which is kind of just before sunset, um, is before the watershed. Um, and here in the UK, the, 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 the concern or the fear to some extent is that um, if we were to show live animals killing each other or mating or something like that, that it would be inappropriate content for children. And so the challenge is, is to create a great show that occurs after the watershed. And of course, that, that, that's in nighttime. Um, and, um, and so the, the, the show that we, we've been kind of working on with, um, with Barcroft TV is to, um, is to do a seven and a half hour live broadcast that starts at four o'clock in the afternoon local time in Kenya in the, um, in the Mara Triangle. And we, during the migration season, so when, when all the wildebeest are uh, up in Kenya and they're crossing the rivers, and we start with the crossing of the rivers, um, and we broadcast this on, on, on the internet, and we're recording all the footage as we go. And then we, after sunset, we, we stick with, the, with, with um, lions that are um, hopefully hunting, and on most nights they did. Um, and, uh, and we stay with them as they repeatedly try and hunt, um, and sometimes successfully, sometimes not culminating eventually in a, a show that would go out live in Kenyan time um, at about midnight and um, after the watershed here in the UK. And what we did recently, a couple of weeks ago, was we had just one vehicle out um, and we broadcast it only digitally on Barcroft on uh, YouTube as well as um, on, on, on our YouTube channel. No TV customer, just really trying to hone this thing down and trying to work it out. Um, I guess enough introduction. Let's go ahead and Why don't we run the tape? That'd be great. <laughs> that could have been cricket. Every year, millions of wildebeest and zebra make an epic journey. They run the gauntlet to get to greener pastures. streaming in from all over the plains. This is going to turn into one of the most spectacular sightings. Look at this, look at them all. Thousands of them streaming across the plains there. That one's down, that is unbelievable. That's completely gone. This is our first Thompson's gazelle sighting. Look at the crocodile coming after them. Oh my goodness. They're just terrified, poor things. Well done, clever little thing. Make a noise, your mum will come and get you. Here's a lion, there's a lion right next to us. Here we go. Look at this, lion kill live at the crossing. She's got it. Under the cover of darkness, three camera vehicles, three lion prides, on the hunt. Live and interactive. We're witnessing one of the most ancient battles there is in nature. Hyenas versus lions. Look at those hyenas coming in. There's no natural light on them at all. That's all infrared. She's walking straight towards them. They have no idea she's there. My heart is pounding. She looks like she's flanking left. Now she's running. They've killed. A little zebra. 
See, Shao, she's trying to pull his back leg out to get him on the ground. This is life, and this is nature. Well, yeah, congrats, man. Thank you. I have to say, it was um, that sequence uh, when uh, the wildebeest were kind of flowing across the river, thousands of them at once. My phone pinged up. Uh, we've gone live um, from Kenya. And then that just kicked off within a minute, that whole sequence of um, the lion um, capturing all the wildebeest yeah. at that moment on Facebook. And I just suddenly thought, honestly, game changer. Because it's in your pocket, your phone, okay? And your Facebook just goes, and you go, oh, what's going on? Oh my God, check that out. And, and, and it's a total game changer. And it was a really, it, I was emotional in that moment. Because I just thought, what a wonderful thing that is. Um, you know, your presenters, and I'm just going to be nice to Graham for two minutes. It doesn't <laughs> happen very long. Uh, but your presenters, are so good at what they do because they do it every day. It's like anything, yeah. right? That's I would be key. good at I'd be good at gymnastics if I did them every day. You know? No, I don't know about that, Sam. I <laughs> no, I would, mate. Too I would too. <laughs> but um, but they are they're such good presenters because yeah. they most presenters hang out feeling insecure most of the time. Then they do a little bit of work and then they go and hang out and be insecure, do a little bit of work. Your guys are doing six hours a day, man. I mean, they are absolutely slick and they go keep going and keep going, keep going. They can make a termite mound seem interesting for an hour and a half. It's incredible. They're very, very good at their jobs. And so the idea of going live for seven and a half hours, people are going, oh my God, that's a bit of a trick. These guys just kept it flowing all the way through really, really well. Um, but those moments when you got real moments there were just electric television. And you can see the proposition, I think, very, very clearly when you see the, the best of moments there. Um, because you just, anybody in the world is going to be transfixed by what they saw there. It's highly um, engaging, real world drama. So I think it was a really, I was very proud to be part of it because I thought it was very innovative and quite risk taking to spend your own money to go and prove a show works. I do think this says something, and this will be my last bit, on how the high the bar is for people that don't work in-house, um, either at big organizations like yeah. Nat Geo or the BBC. Um, if you are an independent filmmaker and you're not part of a large indie that has a strong, long track record of um, delivering blue chip um, natural history, I do think the fact that you have to innovate to this level and um, to, to kind of bang the door down is, is kind of interesting. But I also do think it's really applaudable to, to, to make content like that off your own back. So um, well done, Graham, anyway. <laughs> um, Thanks, Sam. And what, I'm going to just ask you, what were the biggest lessons you learned from covering the migrations, do you think, and, and what maybe surprised you more than you thought? I, I, it's difficult for, the, for, the, for that specific show um, uh, to, to think of something. I think the, 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 the probably more valuable would be to some of the lessons I've learned in general after having done so many of these shows. And you know, is that the first thing that you mentioned, which is that most times when people set about to, to do a live event, they think of it as an event, and they and they will have a sort of a, a, a planning and production, put a team together, and maybe have a couple of weeks of rehearsals and then and then deliver the show. And that's not enough. And I think the greatest lesson I've learned is that you've got to do it every single day continuously. It takes months, years to get a team to properly coalesce, to, to really to work out every engineering wrinkle and, and to just get the whole thing working together like a, like a streamlined, well-oiled machine. It cannot be something that you just set up and go, because you're going to be so freaked out on the day with you know, insecure presenters and technical issues. So that's a key lesson. It's got to run all the time. I think another key lesson is, as you just talk about the presenters, is that you, you, you don't want people that are going about it thinking that they're presenting. They, if they do that, they're, going to, they're not going to succeed, certainly not for seven and a half hours. They've got to be guiding. This has got to be something that, that for them, it, they've, they've got to feel like you know, they've just got six people on the back of the vehicle. They've got to speak to them like they've got six people on the back of the vehicle. They've got to, they can't think of it as TV. They, it, they've got to think of it as a guiding experience. Otherwise, it, it, it doesn't work. So we, we don't employ presenters. We only employ guides. And then we, we teach them how to do it. And, and I guess another big lesson is that um, technology is all very well and good, but it's hard. And no matter what that technology is, um, it's going to break, and all your assumptions are going to be proved wrong. 
So uh, again, it is get it in there, break it, fix it, break it, fix it, break it, and still have two months before your customer is expecting a product. Um, so I guess that's some of the lessons. Very helpful, thank you. Or well, the third one is um, just get Graham to do it, um, <laughs> which is what I did. Um, so um, Charlotte, coming back round to you, and uh, we, we were having a conversation before, and one of the things that um, struck me is what a wide range of partners you guys mm. have commercially. Um, and, and the fact that you guys have to be quite open-minded about how you collaborate with people and do different things. And um, I know you mentioned Japan there, and, and, mm. the, and, and I was struck by your Orbi project. And mm. Do you want to explain to everybody what that yeah. is and how that came about? So um, Orbi is um, a visitor attraction in Tokyo. Um, Yokohama, which is now on the outskirts of Tokyo, and Osaka, and there's soon to be one in Dubai as well. And um, it's a collaboration with Sega, the games people in Tokyo, in Japan, who approached worldwide to create um, a three-generation, which means grandparents, parents, and children, a three-generation uh, visitor attraction where people can go in the middle of the city and be immersed in nature. And it's using their gaming tech and obviously our storytelling, imagery, and the story around the Earth brand uh, in its sort of many guises. So, um, you know, this is a sort of another one of those things where, I mean, this, the initial approach happened before I arrived. But actually, a lot of these, as you were saying about do it, break it, do it, break it, um, when you have um, a a, an approach from a commercial entity which possibly might seem quite counterintuitive to what you're actually trying to achieve. Obviously, we know that these sort of um, counterintuitive mashups usually create the most engaging results. But obviously, you have to do due diligence and you have to work out whether or not they're crazy or whether or not it's, it's going to work, you know, whether or not you can actually partner. So for that reason, there's a lot of breaking and doing again and breaking and doing again on a lot of the projects that we have because there are very diverse expectations or cultural understandings of what the thing is that you're trying to do. Well, you've got a, a clip to show us um, of a film about a hummingbird. I and, have. Um, and I was really taken by it because I don't think we'd show that in the UK, would we necessarily? I mean, it's uh, a wonderful piece of work and you yeah. can see, I can see I'm a big Jeff fan of Japan, a oh, little rhyme there, um, but uh, I, I think I can see why it works so yeah. well for them because it's so beautifully done. I don't know, I, I, it's slightly outside of what I'd, exact, I'd expect a BBC Earth project to look and sound like because of my old school yeah. ways and means. But why? What's the, maybe we should look at it first, but... Charlotte, I'm asking the questions. Let's just get that straight, all right? <laughs> well, um, you know, but, you know. The table they, you're, you're right, you're right. Yeah. But that's the point, isn't yeah. it? That's the point. And this is kind of why we're taking the, the discussion in this direction, because I think it's really important. What I'm kind of looping around to in a fairly hopeless way is <laughs> the fact that these challenges of linear TV being more and more restricted in terms of hours, numbers of commissions, loads of super sexy young people coming out of Kelly college who actually know how to edit and stuff that took me 20 years to work out. Um, you know, there's all these challenges around, but actually innovation is creating an opportunity maybe more that, you know, the fact that it's really hard in the old school world means that you just have to get involved in the mm. new school world if you're like me, under 30. You know, you've got no <laughs> choice, right? Because it's going to be all gone in 30 years time, so we've yeah. got to be in the new world, and that creates opportunity. Yeah. And so BBC Earth is wonderful because BBC Earth are innovating I think at m some levels higher in a lot of ways than the main commissioning channels because they're having to aim globally and um, and take opportunist opportunistic control. Does yeah. that make sense? But it's all, it's um, you know I think we're very comfortable to admit that we're all slightly making it up as we go along. Don't tell anybody I think that. Nightingales here, but. But you know, we do, every partnership brings a new uh, audience and basically everything that we do, not like telly, if you make a Duff episode and you can deliver it and then go to the pub and sort of, you know, I go to Japan and all these places and sit next to the person who's bought a ticket to watch the thing or to go and interact with the, all the interactive stuff we do. 
And if they look miserable and pissed off, it's my problem. I've created the stuff that doesn't work. So, you know, it's real live feedback, which is unavoidable, and commercial partners that have got ticket and footfall that they've got to realise. So, but when it works, you know, when you're brave and when you push it, you know, you, what we can also do is sort of push the language which the Earth brand feels happy with. So when we did the YouTube channel Unplugged, we did a collaboration with Zay Frank. We did true facts about the star-nosed mole and about some other animals. Now, when we did that four years ago, that language, you know, Zay Frank, BuzzFeed, BuzzFeed fame, you know, it was very irreverent, a bit sweary, and it was lots of our archive which had been ripped off uh, of YouTube. And when we phoned him and said, do you want to do it? He was like, this is brilliant. I can do it with you guys, and I'm not ripping the, the material off. But it was a language which many of us hadn't seen applied to archive, you know, to our archive. And as soon as we did, everybody didn't go, oh, my God. Everybody said, brilliant, this is great. It just frees up where you can take that story and how comfortable we feel with it. And I'm glad I'm a taxpayer when BBC Earth are actually innovating and doing new, exciting, fresh things, because we're lucky to have a part of the BBC. Uh, there are lots of parts innovating, but it's really important for natural history. We did a session earlier where it was obvious that the demographic for natural history on television skews quite old. Mm. So it's nice that there's a part of full of good looking people. They told me earlier my stuff would never get on the channel. I had to agree. but. Um, should we run the, the yeah? The can I do, so yeah, the, yeah. So the, the the clip is so. Just this screen's quite small. The screen that we project these films on is 140 foot long and 30 foot high, and they have 4D. There are butt kickers in all the seats, so everybody's vibrating, and there's smoke, and there are back screens, so it's like a 360 thing, and the screen curves as well, so you're sitting in it and you're surrounded by it. When we started, we started doing it with Archive, because that was the deal. Then the dragon came out, the 6K dragon, and we sort of went, mm, we could sort of shoot them. And before we knew it, we were shooting them this big. Uh, it's 5-1, basically, the ratio. So we did meerkats, because they stand in a 5-1 line like that, because basically you frame that. But this one is, every year we do an Archive one and an originated one. This is the latest Archive one. This is a mashup of beautiful archive, but in a story which you could never imagine. And we had to make it fantastical so that you could put all these animals in the same story. And then we looked at it and said, if you're going to do fantasy, do fantasy, make it a fairy tale. If this is, you know, kawaii, you know, J Japanese who just want to, the most glorious, over-the-top language and approach, um, who also are very, very massively connected to their planet, have a very deep uh, sort of philosophical connection to the planet. So very, very complicated audience. But, you know, with these films, it's, they have to be brave and they have to have a really clear tone and personality. So this is in Japanese, I think, uh, but we've got subtitles on it, if anybody doesn't speak Japanese. And it is really f small. Other than that, enjoy. Let's go for it. <laughs> の森がありました。でも、ただの森ではありません。ここは地球にいるすべての生き物が共に暮らしている魔法の森だったのです。Oh, it's very short. Pretty magical, though, isn't it? Yeah, I think this, there's this another one coming. Oh, okay. Do you I think that might be in English. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, just for it those might be of us that can. Okay. So he's good, but not that good. He's good, but not as good yeah, as her. No. Shall we roll the second orbit yeah. clip, please? The next. 
next creature he met was a bowerbird. A flame bowerbird, one of the most flamboyant creatures in the forest. Hello, said Hector. Can you help me reach my heart's desire? Damn! Heart's desire, replied the flame bird. I got my own heart's desire. Getting the ladies to love me and only me. Oh, said Hector. And how do you do that? Well, you gotta shake it. Check this out. And that, that's got massive disco balls on the back screens and all the lights all over Throb. It's, I, I was there a week ago, and I'm not OK, actually. I did think people might be sick, but they weren't. Amazing. Yeah. Well, it's kind of interesting. I went to Universal Studios um, for a bit of uh, research in Florida at Easter. And uh, 4D experiences are all the thing, right? Mm. You know, they yeah. are absolutely amazing. Mm. Take kind of experiential up a massive notch and mm. means that you can pay $500 for your family to go somewhere for the day and not feel ripped off, <laughs> yeah, exactly. which is kind of amazing, isn't yeah. it, as a machinery? And, um, and it does show how you can take footage, which is absolutely incredible, let's just say mm. that first off, but you can super scale it mm. into um, something that is not just um, a sit it in the corner of the room and, and kind of have it interrupt you during nice Twitter moments. You know, mm. it's actually a um, much more kind of obviously fully immersive, luxurious experience. Yeah. So congrats to you and the team for that. It's Thank a you. really yeah. expe ex exceptional piece of work. So we're kind of um, coming towards the end of the session here. Um, we've hardly even scratched the surface, which is really frustrating because we wanted to talk a lot about how we all feel this, is, well, I certainly wanted to talk about the opportunities that are coming up through short form and experiential and live. Um, especially around Facebook Live, which is, you know, I think a real incredible opportunity for anyone on the planet to talk to three billion people at once in real time. But we've kind of come to the questions bit. So um, can we, who's got a good question to help me out here? Okay. Anyone got a spare mic? Because I'm not giving mine up. Yeah, hi, I'm Peter Hamilton, and I have a question for Graham. I mean, that footage was incredible, but can you replicate that in other situations and in other territories, like dingoes hunting wallabies or some other environment? Never thought of dingoes hunting wallabies, um, but um, yes, I think so. I think, there are, I think there are a variety of different opportunities all around the world. Um, I think Africa is always, you know, Africa is special in the sense that it's got just such an incredible density of iconic animals, particularly when you're dealing with killing and hunting and that sort of a thing. But certainly uh, Pantanal in, um, you know, in, the, in, in Brazil, in South America, um, uh, certain parts of India um, that um, with, with around the tigers. And, and I think, you know, and probably many others, um, Caribou migration uh, comes to mind, but my personal, you know, my, my passion is is marine, and it's something that I've wanted to to do for a very long time, um, and it's very challenging because a key aspect of live is the interactivity, and and underwater, if you start getting your diver to talk, um, he gets out or she gets out of breath, and the whole thing, you know, becomes. <sighs> You know, and it's just the whole thing gets like kind of crazy. So we've been doing various experiments with live narrations where there's interaction between the diver and the, and, and the narrator. Um, and, and it's a challenge, but I, I really believe it can be done. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, yes, it can be replicated. I think it can be. Yeah, the Pantanal's got one of my favorite animals in it. But you do so much Jaguar Cayman Yeah, fighting. Jaguar Cayman kickoffs. <laughs> yeah. The best Jaguar there has been there for ages, and he's only got one eye. Uh, Does anyone know his name? One um, eye? Mick. <laughs> <laughs> Mick Jaguar. He's <laughs> famous. <laughs> he's amazing. He's got one eye, and he's just a bad boy, because just every Cayman that comes over, he just sneaks up on them and just 
takes them out like that, has them for lunch. He's wow. amazing, Mick. Look him up. He's brilliant. <laughs> um, so yes, there's lots of uh, places that uh, Graham's going to be rolling out his amazing um, effects. And also, it's an interesting time zone thing, isn't it? Because if yes. you're going live around the world, you have to think about where your audiences are. So our peak time online audiences are between 4 and 5 p.m. UK. So if you, I don't know that everybody's are, but I think in English-speaking platforms, that's probably a fairly normal thing, because um, that's the same for us across all our channels. So if you know you're going to be speaking to 3 million people on average at that point in the 24-hour cycle, I suppose you've got to yeah, find somewhere. You've got to work backwards or exactly. forwards mm -hmm. and find wildlife activity that's happening regularly and try and fit that in. In those holes, yeah. yeah. We've done a lot of work on it. It's theoretically possible, but hugely complicated. And, and brands, I suppose, is a, a really powerful potential way forward because you've been working with various tourist boards and channels and, 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 yeah. and other things. It, Not I, brands, suppose, yeah. I suppose the opportunity for both of you exists in a much bigger money pit doesn't it really if you think if we all think co commercially about this yeah. especially for people starting out or people who haven't yet won uh, the oscars emmys and um, other awards that bbc producers have won mm. um, you know i think there is a great opportunity given by these platforms isn't there completely yeah, yeah. so sorry i forgot i wasn't supposed to be talking anymore um, who's next No. Free wine, I think, is kicking yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, I think it's becoming more <laughs> and more of a draw, isn't it? <laughs> well, um, I'm going to ask um, a couple more questions because otherwise I'm going to feel like I've shortchanged everybody. Charlotte, what do you think the, the, the innovative opportunities are at the moment for you guys? Is there, is there one certain area that you're getting more excited about? As, as you know, Because the Earth Unplugged channel has been great on YouTube, hasn't it? And, yeah. Um, and, and you're doing experiential, plus you're doing everything else. Is there a certain trend or, or, or area that you're feeling more excited about or where, where, where there's a, a kind of push for BBC Earth at the moment? Um, well, there's the technology side, which obviously um, is something that everybody feels that they need to, to be across. I mean, I think that doing all be allowed us to understand before VR really kicked in how you play within a big space. So if you sit in that theater, it's like having a 140 foot head mask, you know, thing on. Um, how to play people's attention around that screen. So that was a really great thing for us to get across to then jump into VR. So we're constantly looking at where, um, where technology is taking us, and AR obviously is the next big thing. That's augmented um, reality for anybody who doesn't know, yeah. which is the idea you can actually interact with the imagery uh, on your screen. But it's also looking at the markets that you know are the focus for the Earth brand, and um, in a North America, there are the um, institutions, science institutions, and um, like that, which is actually a massive opportunity for us to engage with people who are, you know, um, aspirational families who want to engage with our sort of content. And there are vast numbers of people who are going to these places, apparently more than go to see live sport in North America. In terms of museums and galleries yes, and things yeah, like that? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we have a presence in giant screen and 4D theatres, uh, cinema experiences. And so obviously with that, there are many other opportunities which you can, you know, which can spin off that. And then it's how we how we pull all these opportunities together so that they're not isolated incidents, that they're all leveraging each other. So they're all coming back to the one kind of Yeah, so they're theme. feeding off each other because yeah. at the moment it's very easy to have disparate bits of activity. But for us, where we have quite a lot of disparate global um, business, is to actually then create, you know, allow it to, you know, amplify each other. So... Yeah, so it's the idea that BBC Earth, everything comes back to the BBC Earth yeah, brand yeah. from whether it be a, a short YouTube film or an amazing experiential yeah. or something. But it's, it's also, you know, when we were on the ships, um, uh, I was in Alaska in May putting in all this content, the game show and everything. And what's really exciting is seeing the range of people who are genuinely thrilled 
to see our content, who, you know, you might assume a sort of cruise ship in Alaska, which is the first, everybody's on there because the food's really cheap. They're probably not looking out at Alaska. They're just going on a week of free food and booze. Terribly cynical, and that. Um, no, no, no. Well, they are. The first, the first ship out, they are, and, and, and that's it. And we did Frozen Planet in concert, which George Fenton had reorchestrated. We had String Quartet, which had been flown in from London. You know, we'd, we'd staged the whole thing. It looked beautiful. And then you're thinking, how's this going to go down? Because they have jazz hands the night before, which is beautiful, sort of Broadway show stuff, which is appropriate for the ship and the, and the holiday experience. And then our, our, you know, the Frozen Planet in concert, there were standing ovations. And, you know, that is really exciting, going to see these various projects that we have and actually see the range of people and what really excites them and what it means to them. The fact that punters are still very focused on natural history experiences yeah, yeah. of the highest quality, I yeah. suppose, is no, the interesting part, yeah. isn't it? And, yeah. and grab, it's I would say... very universal. Yeah, and, and travels wonderfully well, yeah. so, as we all know. So, um, Graham, I suppose I notice when I watch um, Safari Live... Um, the interaction and comments, um, which is really fascinating, because both on Facebook Live and YouTube Live, whether you've done it or not, you'll notice that there's an incredible console which has a lot of uh, the ability for everyone to chat while they're watching the stream. And that's what you talked about around audience interaction, right? Totally. And yeah. so we did an experiment, and we're still running a collaboration on our new Animals channel where we take a feed from Graham. Our comments went up from... 100 a day to 5,000 a day um, within one um, broadcast. So I think um, as we go forward and people don't really care how many views you've got because they'll assume they're from some computer farm in Hyderabad rather than real people. They will because they probably are um, if you're being paid for Facebook, by a brand. you don't even know where they're, if they're No, real. exactly. <laughs> um, so like genuine human interactivity seems to be a real premium, whether at the very highest end it's somebody paying a lot of money to be in a, an environment, um, a BBC Earth concert or something similar. But also... Um, Graham, you may be getting five figures of views on your live stream, but actually the value of those is far higher if lots of people are physically interacting and, and conversing with your guides. And um, I suppose that shows that people are very focused on live, i.e. they interact with it in a way that's much uh, more likely for them to comment than if they're just watching something because it's a lean-in experience, I suppose. And I think... Um, that's been our experience of working with Safari Live has been the fact that Live is incredibly potent when it comes to get grabbing people's 100% attention in a way that I think most other forms of entertainment other than experiential now aren't. And so I suppose in summing up, I don't know whether there's anything that you, you were talking briefly about wanting to get closer to consumers with BBC Earth yeah. when we talked before. C can you explain that a bit for people who might not understand? As, as producers, we're all thinking, how do we get closer to a commissioner who's going to pay us loads of money and then they can worry about yeah. the audience? Yeah. Well, we were talking about innovation, and I think that, um, you know, 20 years ago, innovation was, are we going to do HD? Then are we going to do 4K? And then as the content sort of spreads off platform, you know, content and branding and messaging has now gone so far off platform, essentially it is all a way of reaching the consumer. So what I find really fascinating is working with brands that may not be the most, you know, may not be media brands, but actually enable us, as I was saying with the, the example of the cruise ship, enable us to understand what really thrills people, what they're actually, you know, so it could be VR, it could be high-end AR, VR, or it could be a packet of top trumps. You know, people, humans, will choose how they consume their entertainment, and it doesn't have to be on an acceleration of high-end tech. It's essentially a way of communicating with people in, on a daily basis that they can fit into their life, that they find easy and they find thrilling and engaging. And so it can be, a, it can be many, many different form, you know, form of entertainment. And I think that's what we constantly are watching is how people are consuming entertainment, not just on a digital platform. And Graham, if you had one bit of advice to the um, to any younger producers out there in the audience, um, you know, based upon your entrepreneurial journey right now, um, do you feel it's an opportune moment in your career at the moment? And, and have you got any advice for younger people in terms of these new opportunities? 
I guess. Um, I, think, I think that one word... Apart from don't do live, whatever you do. <laughs> no, no, do live. Uh, is, is that I think the, probably the best piece of advice I can give, I think, is that is, is, is authenticity has to be at the core of whatever you produce. The world has, um, ha, ha, I, I feel, I uh, could be wrong, but I feel that the word reality in television has come to mean something, everything other than reality. And that there's a serious hungering out there from an audience for genuine authenticity, to really connect with people and nature on a truly authentic level, um, without, without overhyping things or, or, or you know, going down some preconceived kind of overly scripted area is that it's just genuine authenticity. People see it straight away and they react incredibly positively to it, including interacting and, and so on. And they, they really hunger for it. So be authentic, everyone. Um, OK, well, look, thank you so much to Charlotte and Graham for coming along today and sharing their uh, thoughts. And thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.